Hey there. Welcome to Should I Do Ultimatum in 323 and my guide on how to approach the mechanic to get easy wave tens. Uh, first thing I want to show off here is a spreadsheet of all the data that I've accumulated over the course of about 80 maps of completing ultimatums. For the most part, I fully completed every single ultimatum except for a few of them in my grueling test where I was killed by an unfortunate set of mods. We'll uh, say about that. But in this spreadsheet, you can see I've accumulated all of my information about my time to complete each map, which is basically just me running from the start of the map directly to the ultimatum and then completing the ultimatum and leaving the map. So there's a little bit of there's a little bit of this time here that's basically just running to the ultimatum that isn't like actually time spent in the ultimatum for its rewards. But because of like time in between maps and like personal like, lag between maps that you might have doing stuff in real life and so on, I've I've kept this time here to have like a more accurate representation of like profit per hour. I've kept track of chaos, exalts, and divines per hour. Specifically, these three currencies because these are the three most easily liquidable currencies. Uh, it's worth noting that I only got divines during my gilded test, so the chaos per hour of the gilded test is skewed a little bit higher than it should be. If you take these out, it's basically only marginally better than the normal rare T16 section. But in here I've also tracked each type of catalyst and how much of each catalyst I got, the total number of catalysts I got in a map, as well as the total value of the catalyst in the map. I also noted down anything that was of relatively notable value. For the most part, I skipped anything that was under 5C or was like 5 to 6C, but I didn't really want to sell. So there'll be more profit if you're doing this like towards the first few days of a league when you're going to be selling basically everything to get all the currency you can get. And then on the far right here is the total value of everything, including catalysts and the extra notable items that I include. And if we go into this tab, you'll see the specifics on what items rolled in each wave uh, from wave eight and onward. So the waves past the guaranteed catalyst drop. So if you're interested in seeing like what kind of things drop at the later waves, you can have them here. And you know, there's also information from up to wave 13 in the uh, grilling S. And in here we have, this is just a generic, a generalized version of what each wave gave. So for the most part, I categorized everything into a set of cat a different type, a reward type. It's worth noting that Fragment is basically the accumulation of all different League mechanics, except for Oil, apparently, um, because League mechanic items in general, like Breach Scarabs, or Breach Splinters, um, and like Legion Fragments, like that sort of thing, were so infrequent on their own that I just kind of clumped them all into a single fragment category. And then otherwise there's currency, which is the most common in general, not just because I have the uh, Atlas node for it. It's worth noting that I do have the Atlas node that increases uh, the chance of your ultimatum rewards being the currency. And then the other categories are rare, which is what everyone complains about in the first early waves of it, div cards, Maps, which pretty much for the most part, I believe, were entirely corrupted and almost none of them were good. Uh, gems, uniques, inscribed ultimatums, jewels, and then oil, which realistically should be fragment, but whatever. I've also categorized uh, wave 9 plus only, which means the waves past the final uh, catalyst bit, which uh, is the only waves that can actually spawn divines and exalts and other like mega rare uniques that's worth noting so this is an important number for that these are pre pre wave nines so this is when the you can't get mega rare items like divines and so on this is the distribution of each reward there currency still is the top rares are much more common here than in wave nine plus actually rares don't spawn at all i found in wave nine or above and then down here is the pre wave four which is, doesn't actually include wave one because I was running the standard round notable the entire time, which incre basically increases your effective round. So I don't have data on wave one, but as you can see, it's already at a, essentially a 40-ish percent chance to give a rare only looking at waves two and three. Meaning if we also included one, the chance of getting a corrupted rare in an ultimatum between the first and third waves is probably close to 50%. That is 
worth noting. Uh, that's probably why so many people have complaints about it, is that you get these really stinky rares in the first three waves, and then like also a good number of them in the middle waves. And honestly, they were pretty much all bad. I don't think a single one of them is sold yet. So do they really consider them in my profit, essentially, at all. Um, the other useful stat is at the bottom of this, you'll see I have the distribution of catalysts. You can see that intrinsic is Intrinsic is by far the most common. And then there's like a tier below that where this turbulent, imbued, abrasive, and noxious appear to be the next most common. And then you have the rare catalyst uh, section where it is tempering, fertile, accelerating, prismatic, and unstable. The sort of ones that seem like they would be more rare, the, the tempering I believe is, I don't remember tempering, but fertile is like life, accelerating is like speed. Prismatic is resistance, unstable is crit. Like those special looking ones, they're not like, they're not like attribute or other like attack mods and defense mods. But yeah, it's interesting to see that intrinsic makes up over 25% of the total number of catalysts that I got here. Whether or not that's skewed, this is still relatively a small sample size in the grand scheme of things, but it seems relatively true that there's at least two separate tiers Intrinsic might be a little bit lucky, so maybe Intrinsic is in the same tier as the other ones, but either way, that data's there if you're interested about it. Over 80 maps, I got about 2300 Chaos worth of Catalysts alone, just Catalysts. Um, but yeah, that's that. And near the overall profit data, there's 20 maps of each strategy. I have the total number of Catalysts. You can see that Rare and Gilded. Gilded rare, about the same number of catalysts per slightly more for the Gilded one, because technically the Gilded version gives you an extra wave of potentially rolling catalysts, because you get, you get an extra roll on the like good loot table past wave, effective wave 9. The total catalyst value for everything in that uh, small test, you can see that the non-Gilded actually won in value, because I actually got a 14 prismatic roll in there. Total chaos value as well as the time spent, the chaos per hour, and the chaos per hour with catalyst only. It is worth noting that the chaos per hour is skewed by the divines that I mentioned before. So if you actually get rid of the divines from this, the number, you can see that the chaos per hour for gilded is only slightly higher. And as a result, I personally don't think that gilded catalysts are worth it, but you do you. I don't think they're worth it. They're like 60 each because people use buy them in bulk for generic Gilded Scarabs at 60 each. Uh, but yeah. Another thing worth noting is that if you weren't aware, Catalysts have a guaranteed spawn on wave four and on wave eight, which is modified by the notable on the Atlas tree, Stand Your Ground, which basically says you gain rewards as if you completed a round further. If you have that, it means you get your catalyst on waves three and seven instead. But for the purpose of this sheet, I've recorded effective wave, which means that, just as you can see here, you guaranteed get catalyst on wave four and eight. So if you're doing ultimatum, you should aim to always get at least wave eight. Or if you're really early in the league, like day one, always try to get to wave four. Because catalysts, as we saw in the profit stats, are the majority of the profit in this league mechanic. You can see here that in the rare T16, it's about, I wanna say like 60, 70-ish percent. I am bad at doing mental math without looking, without actually typing it, but uh, this one's a little bit skewed because of the divines, but it's probably closer to 50, 60% in the gilded one, in the same number here. So it's worth trying to go for these catalysts as your priority before dipping out of an ultimatum there. Very, very lucrative part of this. And of course that'll change depending on the market. Keep that in mind. Uh, it's also worth noting that the random rewards between uh, b uh, between one to eight, excluding four and eight, cannot roll catalysts. So five, six, seven, one, two, three, these waves cannot roll catalysts. They do not roll catalysts. They can only roll catalysts on four and eight, and then nine onwards. So this is the only place the catalyst can roll. Otherwise, five to seven, one to three can only roll like these these sections that I have here. So divs, maps, uniques, gems, fragments, or these ones, and jewels, stuff like that. So if you're really looking to maximize catalysts, hit wave eight, 
go as far past wave eight as you can to potentially get more catalysts. And that's also the place where you get the real profitable items like divines, exalts, rare uniques, and fun. Now let's get into ultimatum in 323. Should you do it? Probably. Maybe. Good when no one else is doing it, like it is currently. Depends on the volume of catalysts in the market, because if they're cheap, because right now something like prismatic catalysts are 20c a pop in reasonable bulk. And the other thing is whether or not you can do wave tens consistently. Doing wave tens consistently is extremely important, basically never dying at all in the ultimatum before you leave it yourself is almost required. Otherwise, the profit of ultimatum goes down drastically. Sub-general, tips and info, catalyst spawn on wave four and eight, as I mentioned before, with no variance at all. And there's also no guaranteed catalyst that you may think on wave 12. For example, if you were to do the Grueling Gauntlet Keystone and it goes with wave 13, you will not see a guaranteed catalyst on wave 12. So it's not just every four waves. It's just wave and eight specifically. Anything regarding wave numbers is their true number. If you use a notable or a gilded such wing scarab, you should decrement them accordingly. For example, using the standard ground notable, which you can see here on the left, or a gilded ultimatum scarab, which you can see on the right with the mods. Ultimatum encounter in your map, grant rewards as though you completed an additional round. Decrement the number by one. If you use both, it's actually two and six, or if you use the notable with a winged scarab, it would be one and five. Map quant does not really affect the normal drops of ultimatum. However, it does affect the catalyst count. This is something that I noticed pretty obviously between my magic and rare T T16 test, where the rare the magic ones were basically just you throw a transmute on it, you alt roll it so you don't get any terrible mods, and you run it. But the rare maps were chiseled and then alked and then re-rolled to be good. So there's a drastic difference in quant, and then you'll see in the spreadsheet, if you look at it linked in the description, you'll see that the number of catalysts you get in the rare one is substantially higher than the magic ones. That's just worth noting. Try to aim. I don't know if this is exactly correct. It just kind of felt like it was true because the one map that I had 99% quant, I rolled one catalyst and nowhere else I, ran, I rolled one in the rare section. So try to aim for at least 100% quant in your maps. Uh, with a full atlas and all of the quant wheel nodes and such, this is roughly 65 to 70% map item quants. So like when you're looking at the map itself, it should say quantity plus 65 to 70% or more for it to get this extra uh, items out of the catalyst area. Moving on to these are my recommendations if you want to get wave tents consistently. You don't need to have all of these. It's just the more you have, the safer you'll be. Uh, other than the first one, which is you should always be running both of the notables in the middle-ish area, middle left-ish area, where you have prove yourself worthy, which basically duplicates rewards or has a chance to duplicate rewards. This thing is crazy good if it procs on like a prismatic catalyst ring, you just instantly gain like ADC or more even. And then there's standard ground, which is the thing we mentioned before, which gives you rewards as though you completed an additional round. But this one is less important because honestly, most of your money is in Catalyst. So as long as you can do the wave tens, it doesn't matter, but it just gives you an extra wave of the like quote unquote good reward pool at the end past the final Catalyst. Uh, the second point is evasion builds are really strong against ruin. It's possible to dodge slash evade ruin inflicting attacks. Block is also good for similar reasons if you're not running Glinting Blow, so you're fully blocking an attack. And has the benefit of Spell Block as well for dealing with the trap damage. High mobility is one of the most important things that I consider. Uh, the faster you are, the harder it is for traps to hit you or the mobs themselves. This is especially important if you end up leveling up Raging Dead due to bad circumstances because the fire wave from these skulls, well easy to dodge with enough mobility, are really nasty if they stack up and hit you with several of the waves at the same time. Uh, the fourth point is damage while moving skills are a big plus for survivability. You don't need these, but these are just, it just makes it a little bit easier to survive. So stuff like totems, brands, uh, persistent skills like blade vortex, uh, castle damage taken loops, brands. I mentioned brands twice in there. <laughs> anyway, fifth point, 
Instant mobility spell unaffected by slows. There's a lot of slows in this, and if you have a spell that is affected by slows of any kind, it could lead to a situation where you get like stunned out of a slow, or you get stunned out of your mobility skill, your mobility skill goes off too slowly, and so on. So Frostbling and Dash are fantastic for this. This is the best of my knowledge. They are both unaffected by cast speed and such modifiers, or and or are otherwise instant, meaning that regardless of how your character is, they will instantly go off when you press the button. There's no chance of you actually being stunned out of it or getting affected by slowing effects. Uh, and it's also important that you link them to life tap because you will run into mana siphoners and especially with and your ground when the lighter waves when the arena shrinks you're it's going to be hard to not stand on the mana ring sometimes and if you lose all of your mana and you can't mobility skill when you need to that could just be a stupid way to die when you when that shouldn't happen uh, a couple quick ones. Freeze immunity, it makes the T4 bomb mod free. Uh, Crypt of Blood immunity, it makes the blade mods co a complete joke until T4. Suppression cap, if you're an invasion build, it's basically like the spell block equivalent. You're going to want some way to mitigate spell hits. Uh, the traps hit like an absolute truck. Do not underestimate them. High Chaos Res, or CI, this is in not as important because there's, you can just avoid the mods of this effect, but having this basically enables you to run the Chaos Cloud mod and the Profane Monsters mod, which is just Physics Extra Chaos, and they just become free mods if you have high Chaos Res or CI. High Regen is a huge asset. Again, not important, but it makes the smoothness of especially later waves a lot better. The stuff like Overleech, Pathfinder, Life Flasks, uh, just innate regen, like the stuff that RF takes, all that stuff, or like Blood Notch Immutable Force setups are all great ways to keep your health high without having to use your Life Flask. Because there's a ton of Dawn effects that are in Ultimatum, such as Degen Grounds, there are mobs that put like a Searing Bond between, between each other for different types of elements, that really hurts. Uh, the Chaos Cloud is another good example. The uh, Fizz Altar, the, what is it called, Blood Altar, that mod that puts a, a ring around the middle that you generally want to avoid, but sometimes you can. Stuff like that. There's a lot of damage over time effects, and if you just have good regen, it keeps you topped in, instead of having to use uh, like instant life flasks to deal with getting chunked from it. And the last two points are Prolith builds are really, really good, and so you can end up chaining onto the new bombs that are spawning, as well as mobs that are on the opposite side of the arena before you even run into them. And lastly, and hilariously, do not use a blue MTX. This is really, this is a really weird one, but ruin chain, ruin inflicting abilities and monsters glow blue. For example, the stalking ruin monster is a very hard to miss blue. Its projectiles are fully blue. If you take the ruin mod, which is the a certain type of monster inflicts ruins with its special abilities, that the monster that that affects will glow blue when they're picked as that monster that inflicts ruin, and the ability that they cast will change to a blue variant as well. So you'll know what mob to be wary of, what spell effect to be wary of, and just not wearing a blue MTX helps a lot with being able to see them. Uh, the other thing is that if your skill is blue by default, try to find an MTX that is not blue. <laughs> it's dumb, but it's pretty important. Uh, now we want to decide on your mod priority. You want to pick what mods you consider free, easy, bad, or brick before even going into the ultimatum. This both speeds up your completion time as well as helping you avoid accidentally picking bad mods or maybe overpicking certain mods so that you end up in a situation where you can't avoid a bad mod. So here are the mods that I consider bad or brick for every build. And uh, it's worth noting that I don't have every icon here. I use PeeweeDB to get the icons, and the icons for some of the newer ones are not there. So if you don't see an icon, that's just because PeeweeDB didn't have it at this time, at least. Anyway, the mods that I consider bad or a brick for every single build, you should pretty much avoid these. Not at all costs, but like, these are bad. Like. Use, your own, use discretion if you want to pick these in a bad situation. So T4 Raging Dead, these are the Fire Skulls. T4, 
hits like a truck, and its AoE is huge. These are very, very easy to die to, especially with Stand Your Ground that shrinks the arena. Be very careful if you pick Raging Dead. If you want, if you want to pick Raging Dead, make sure you have like Spell Suppress Cap, make sure you have like Spell Block, and stuff like that. They hit a lot, and running around in a circle gets them stacked up, which means you can often get hit by several of them at the same time. T3 storm, T3 or higher storm collar ruins. Similar to Raging Dead, these things just hit like a truck. And they're also basically unavoidable. You can't bait them like you can blistering cold, which are the cold mines. If these things go off, they're hitting you. And then at T3 and T4, I believe they leave behind a lightning storm, which also just repeatedly hits you, and you can't avoid it. It just, it just, that also say runes, not ruins. It just really hurts. Do your best to avoid Stormcaller Ruins. I basically try to avoid even T1, T2 of this mod where I can. It just does stupid amounts of damage for no reason. Even when you're... Like, I have a Topaz Flask, and it still hits like a truck. Uh, T2 Blood Altar. This mod is doable depending on the circumstances. Like, T2 Blood Altar basically means on Wave 10 of Stand Your Ground, you have the tiniest area to move because the blood altar is covering the middle and it has a humongous fizz dot so most builds won't be able to stand in it unless you have really high regen um but if you have to pick it it's not a complete brick unless you're doing something like stand in stone circles or storm color ruins at the same time in which case there's basically no way to avoid getting owned by the runes or getting owned by the mobs for stand in stone circles it's just bad don't pick it t4 ruin uh, it's, it's like this one's kind of debatable because you can just you know don't get hit forehead but t4 ruin basically means if you ever mess up once and you get double ticked by an attack that inflicts ruin you're dead because t4 ruin inflicts four ruin when you get hit by a ruin ability meaning you get twice you're gone that can happen easily in one wave if you're careless so just avoid it t4 razor dance Arguably playable, because you can kind of avoid it, but it just leaves behind a really nasty degen that kind of rots you at the same degree as T2 Blood Altar. Uh, it's playable, just it's just avoid it if you can. It's not a brick, but it's really bad. Limited Arena, I consider it a full brick. This mod is almost impossible to play if you're using Stand Your Ground for the Shrinked Arena. This makes your arena so tiny that you're guaranteed to get mobbed by all of the mobs. Any sort of mechanic like uh, Raging Dead or Stormcaller Ruins is basically guaranteed to hit you. Ruin mods are also basically guaranteed to hit you. It is just a horrendous mod. Never take this. Literally never. Nobody ever. This mod sucks. Uh, escalating damage taken. This one is only okay if you're on like wave 9 or 10 where you can potentially get out of the ultimatum before it ramps to full. Otherwise, this mod basically gives you 50% increased damage taken. It basically is if you're in full shock, like 100% shocked, the entire thing. This makes traps stupidly deadly, and I basically avoid this one at all costs. Uh, now, these are mods that I consider good or free for every build. Stalking Ruin. Regardless of the level of this thing, it only ever applies one Ruin with its attacks. Melee is the only real exception, because it might be harder for them to kite around in a circle, but basically, if you can run around in a circle around the edge of the ring, this mod is giga easy. T1 to T3 Razor Dance, if you have Cup to Blood Immunity, free as hell. Does nothing. Blistering Cold, T1 to T3 is free, always. It has relatively low damage, it has an activation time, which means you can dodge it. And T4 is free as well, it basically does the same thing as T3. As long as you have freeze immunity, because T4 guarantees freeze if you're hit by it. So do not do not pick T4 Blood Blistering Cold if you have freeze immunity. Absolutely do if you do have freeze immunity. Now we're going to rapid fire through all of the remaining mods and what makes them good or bad for each type of build. So just hang on tight, we're going to go quick. Choking Miasma. Easy if you have high chaos rate CI or very high life regen. That's it. Storm Color Ruins T1 and T2. These are fine-ish because you can kind of dodge them at this point. Uh, or if you have very high lightning mitigation so they don't hit you as hard, also fine. Raging Dead T1 to T3. These are the, these are the Fire Skulls. These are average. They're not hard to dodge, 
but if you get stunned or slowed or you're a slow build, it's very easy for them just to like shoot three of them almost at the same time at you and just shotgun you and kill you. Be careful with this one. Ruin T1 to T3. T1 is basically always free. It, I don't, I honestly don't even, it, T1 is just a joke. T2 and T3 are sketchy if you have bad visual clarity, like if your skill is really hard, makes it really hard to see things, or if you have a blue skill and you didn't change it. Uh, T4, avoid at all costs. We mentioned it before, it's just a brick mod. It's not a brick mod, but it's extremely risky to take. T4 Blade Dance, we talked about it before. It's playable, but it's overall pretty bad. The degen hurts, basically the same thing as Alter T2 if you stand in it. Very deadly, be very careful. Playable, just use your discretion. Totem mods, I consider them basically free. They're, they do basically nothing. They buff mobs, but if you have good damage, you just kind of kill the mobs before they do anything. Um, they, if you get hit by the totem, you also get the buff and the dot that it does to the mobs that get hit. So just have enough passive regen to be able to handle the rot if it hits you. That's, that's basically just it. Reduce recovery. If you use Life Recovery, for example, Pathfinder, as your sustain, this is a hard brick mod. T1 is sustainable short term, but it will probably get you killed if you pick it early. If you don't use Life Recovery, it's free as hell. Lessened Reach. This one is uh, it's less, like 60% less AoE and 60% less projectile speed. It's basically just annoying. There's no real issue taking it in most builds. Be careful if you have a reliance on AoE radius. If you have reliance on AoE radius to do damage, you might not want to take this. Buffs expire faster. If you have a buff in the top left of your screen and it has a timer, if it's affected by temporal change sort of things, it will go away five times as fast. If this is build dependent, uh, if your build relies on buffs, uh, don't use it. It does not affect velocity reaction, otherwise you can use it. Last cooldown reduction. If you use a CD-oriented main skill or rely on cooldown reduction, do not use it. It is a brick. Full brick mod. This mod is terrible if that's the case for you. If you don't, it's free as hell. For people who don't use the CD-oriented stuff, it basically only hurts your movement skill and your guard skills because everything else should have almost no cooldown. Escalating monster speed. This is basically means the mobs uh, gain an attack, cast, and movement speed buff the longer they're alive. This is, this is free, basically. If you do any sort of decent damage, the mobs die before this stacks up basically any amount at all. And unlike its devil brother known as Escalating Damage Taken, this buff is fresh on things that spawn, which means you don't have it like persisting the entire time. Next is Profane Monsters. This is 80% Fizz's Extra Chaos. If you have CI or very high chaos res, this is a joke of a mod. It's giga easy. If you don't, it's very deadly and avoid it. Unlucky crits, this basically just means your chance to crit is unlucky and monsters take 50% less damage from crits. If you're not crit based, just take it. It's free, it does nothing. If you have 100% crit, it's manageable because the unlucky chance to crit doesn't do anything to you, but it's a pretty big DPS loss. If you're under 100% crit and crit reliant, I would not recommend this mod at all. Hindering flasks, this mod is relatively free. If you're a slow build, this can be dangerous as it will slow down you a lot. But if you're a fast build, so the 50% reduced movement speed doesn't affect you as much. It's it's pretty, it's okay, it's fine. Especially if you're using the Warden of the Magi movement speed in this league. Uh, in that case, it's pretty free. But if you're not in 323, then this one can be a little more dangerous. Drought! This is basically, you can't gain flash charges. If you don't use flash charges, flasks to survive, it's free. It is a hard brick otherwise. Never pick it. Pathfinders, this is your this is your nightmare. This this one right here. Uh, ailment and curse reflect. Uh, this is, honestly, unless you're reliant on curses to do damage, this is pretty free. So unless you're playing Impending Doom. If you look at a eight mod corrupted map and you see hexproof and you're like, I can't do this map because of hexproof, this ultimate mod is also a brick for you. Don't do it. Uh, it's also a brick for anyone that is a shock and chill scaling build, so I'm thinking like old school, uh, what is it, Lightning Conduit, that build. I don't think it scales off of shock anymore, or there's something that doesn't, I don't remember. But don't do it if you scale off of shock or chill either, because it reflects non-damaging elements as well. Lightning damage from mana costs. I didn't change the icon, but that's fine. This should be like a little lightning bolt. Uh, 
This is free as heck for life tap builds or low cost builds, so like archer builds that use the minus mana cost rings to get their cost down to like one mana. Uh, this is dangerous for builds that have like pretty decent mana costs or high mana cost or spammable abilities with decent mana costs. Uh, this will accumulate to a lot of damage if you're not careful in that case. Also, if, you ha if you're a mana stacker and you press I can cloak, you basically just die. <laughs> be, be careful. Uh, Treacherous Auras, unless you're an aura stacker or an aura bot, this is pretty much a free mod. Uh, the mobs just die. Doesn't really matter. Occasional Impotence. Uh, people seem to think this one is terrible, but I honestly don't think it's bad. Maybe it's because I'm playing a dot build. I think it's very easy for any dot build, since dots will still tick. You just can't deal damage to apply new dots. That's it. Uh, siphon charges. If you don't rely on charges to do damage, it's free. If you do, don't take it. Uh, lethal rare monsters just adds two mods to... Or adds two rare mods to every rare monster. If you have bad single target or are squishy, don't take it. Because the rares will probably own you. Otherwise, it's free. Uh, from this point on, the icons weren't on... UEDB, so you're just going to have a picture of the Trial Master in your face. Precise Monsters, this space, this is the one, I believe, where all hits are unavailable. Basically means evasion's useless. It's bad for evasion builds, free otherwise. Shielding Monsters is monsters gain 50% attack and spell block. It's basically just annoying. Like the Expedition mod, it will just slow you down, but doesn't really hurt you. Otherwise, potentially avoid if your build relies on two hits to do damage. So, for example, cast on crit builds. Uh, overwhelming monsters. This is kind of the opposite of precise monsters. It's really bad for armor-based builds, and it is free as hell otherwise. Deadly monsters. Uh, this is the one where monsters are guaranteed to crit. This is an extremely deadly mod, and especially with the map mods that are like bonus crit multiplier. Uh, you should also you should avoid this one if you don't have crit mitigation. For example, poison. Uh, mastery. I don't believe this applies to traps, it's only to monsters. So if you're also confident on never getting hit by a monster, you can also take this mod. Prismatic monsters is monsters gain 50% fizz as extra for every single type of element. So fizz, fire, and cold. This is pretty easy if you have good elite defenses or are overall tanky. It basically just adds a standard fizz as extra whatever to your map. That's it. Resistant Monsters is just annoying again. It just slows you down. It just it adds 50% all res to all of the ultimatum mobs. You don't really notice it if you have good damage or if you have heavy uh, resistance reduction. Uh, it's also free on any Fizz build because Fizz doesn't care about resistance. It doesn't add armor or anything. Dexterous Monsters. This is the one that adds uh, a giga chance to suppress, I believe, and 500% increased evasion. Uh, again, it just slows you down. It's just kind of annoying. If you have good damage, you really probably won't notice it. Uh, it's, it could potentially be bad for stuff like cast on crit. The same thing as uh, the block one, where you need to like hit with your attack and then also hit with your suppressed spell. In that case, it's kind of bad. Also, if you have hits cannot be evaded in your build, it's pretty free because then the 500% increase evasion doesn't matter at all. And then lastly, siphoning monsters. This is... Uh, Monster hits will drain 10% of current ES and mana. Uh, for any ES stacking build or mana stacking build, don't take it. It is, it, you'll just die. It's actually kind of hilarious. If you're not, it's free. So go ahead and take it. So now we're gonna go into when to pick each mod. Because you don't just blindly pick mods randomly if you want to consistently get wave tens. So here's how I prioritize them. Any reference, and it's also worth noting, any reference to a tier in this case refers to the, the tier of the mod it will be when selected. So for example, T2 is the starting point, assuming you have the uh, Atlas node that starts everything in tier higher. Note this is the general priority. Certain mod combinations can make it very dangerous to pick certain ones, so you should adjust accordingly, especially in the later waves. My general priority is the free and easy single tier mods, the and then the easy tiered mods that have not been selected yet, or have been selected once, the T2 and T3 mods. Then the same thing, but for the hard tiered mods, not the bricked ones, not the ones that are bricks, 
but just in general, the harder T2, T3 ones. The ones you picked not at all, and the ones you picked once. And then any of the easy T4s, so for example, if you have Freeze Immunity T4 Blistering Cold, or if you have CI, the T4 Chaos Cloud. Uh, after that is hard single tier mods. These are, some of the hard single tier mods are pretty bad. And then second to last is the hard T4 mods, the tiered mods like T4 Raging Dead, and stuff like that, T4 Stormcolor Ruin. Uh, and then lastly is Brick Mods, but if you ever get into a situation where you have to pick a Brick Mod, or just have to pick a mod which is likely to kill you, just take rewards and leave. It doesn't matter, it's not worth risking all of the items. Now we're going to put that into a little bit of an action. We're going to talk a little bit about, about what you should do in certain situations. So I'm going to have a few examples here. Feel free to pause to make your decision. But in this situation, what should you pick? Assume the build is a proj-based poison pathfinder. Assume that I do have capped chaos res, freeze immunity, and corrupted blood immunity. Of these three options, what would you pick first? This is the first option on the ultimatum. Unlucky crits, choking miasma T2, or lessened reach. Now, if you picked unlucky crits, you're correct. This is because this build is not crit based and my priority list tells me to focus easy single tiered mods first. While Choking Miasma is a very easy mod, it's better to focus on easy single tiered mods first because they don't show up as often. Now, in the same situation, but this is the next option, what would be your next choice? Hindering Flasks, Blistering Cold T2, or Reduced Covery T1? In this situation, I would pick Blistering Cold T2. In this situation, while Hindering Flask is somewhat easy for Pathfinder due to the amount of movement speed it gets, Blistering Cold is an extremely free mod and takes priority. Now, this is a situation later into an ultimatum. We've sped up the waves a bit. Look at the selected mods before you make your decision on the left. What would be your choice here? And feel free to pause to read everything. You may be surprised by this, considering that I had this as a brick mod for life recovery based builds such as Pathfinder. But, for me personally, this is one of the situations where you deviate slightly from the priority list based on the situation. Ruin T4 I consider to be an even harder brick on the brick list, <laughs> and because you can just kind of lose your ultimatum in a single go, just do a little bit of carelessness. Flaming Dead T4 would otherwise normally be my pick. However, due to hindering flasks and blistering cold both being present, I decided to not pick it. This is because those two cause a lot of slows and micro stuns when they hit, and can be, and can very easily cause me to die because I get like slowed or stunned and get kind of hindered into a shotgun of T4 flaming deads. It is very dangerous even if you're really tanky. Now, back to the same scenario, but I changed the reduced recovery to escalating damage taken. What would you pick now, assuming this is a choice on wave nine? If you picked Flaming Dead T4, you would be correct. At least in my opinion. You can have a different opinion. Two full waves is enough time for escalating damage taken to ramp to almost full, depending on your damage and depending on the type, especially if it's standing in stone circles. And gives plenty of time for Ruin T2 to hit you twice if you're not careful. Tim Flaming Dead T4 is simply deadly, but you can attempt to play around it in the worst case scenario like here. This is a, this scenario, these three choices are like horror tier. You never want to see this. It is horrifying. It's worth noting, however, if this was t if this was wave 10, I would have picked escalating damage taken. Since as I mentioned before, it's actually okay to take on a final wave because it likely won't ramp to full by the time you complete the wave, drastically reducing how much it impacts your survivability. When do I think ultimatum is good to do? Uh, you're sitting in the sort of early to mid-game-ish investment range. 
maybe a little bit further. I wouldn't go any earlier. Maybe a little bit further to the mid, maybe mid-late. Uh, in my opinion, there's many other better profitable things to do once you've invested a lot in your character. This build doesn't really scale with how good your character is once you can start doing ultimatums uh, consistently. Other than um, if you can find a way to 100% consistently do Grueling Gauntlet 13 wave ultimatums, then it might scale, but this, to me, in my opinion, this doesn't scale well into like late, so keep that in mind. Uh, you're playing a strong baseline build. Uh, tying in with number one, if your build isn't like a home-cooked, bad kind of home-cooked build, who dies to red maps normally, uh, you should consider, like, it's a, it's a lot better in that case. Uh, to do this in an early game mid-investment range, you probably want, like, a solid build. So, like, a, a tried and tested build that's good at the early mid-game and can, like, do good on, like, lower amounts of investment. You don't want something that relies on a ton of investment to do because you just won't survive. And that's generally what I'm getting at here with that. A uh, third point is you don't like running in a circle on stop. That's basically ultimatum in a nutshell. You're running around in a circle in either direction. You can flip up, flip, uh, change it up if you want. But you're basically running in a circle non-stop, uh, killing the mobs as you go. This is because running in a circle basically negates, negates a lot of the mechanics and makes it easier to dodge. Like Chaos Cloud just ends up sitting in the middle. Stalking Ruin just send, so ends up sitting in the middle. The Flaming Heads, the Raging Deads, end up sitting, ended up, ah, end up accumulating in the middle, and then they all like kind of fire at the same time, but you're already moving out of the way of them. So it's, it, yeah, you just run in a circle a lot. Uh, and you like Ultimatum as a mechanic and aren't in it for just the profit. Because realistically, if you just want money, you're probably better off in the early game just running something like white tier map essences, farming, or doing like expedition and selling logbooks, slash doing logbooks and then selling the loot from the vendors. Ultimatum is likely worse than both of those, although it's good, it's not like an amazing money maker. But it's a fun mechanic for those it clicks with, and as long as it's not super popular, it will be pretty profitable for those who do it. Uh, and that is it. Um, after this, I would like to include some footage of me doing ultimatums just to kind of show off the general type of playstyle that you want to look for, the movements and so on. And uh, yeah, if you liked, if you like ultimatum like I do, I hope you'll revisit it because it's getting a lot of bad rap, but I think it's actually quite good for profit in its current state with a small player base but not a lot of people are flooding the market with catalysts so catalysts are pretty good profit yeah check out the spreadsheet in the description if you want to check out the data about stuff and do any sort of data manipulation with that you have my permission to do so feel free to modify it copy it do whatever you want not to the original shape but make a copy and do it yourself um but yeah bye